Good afternoon and welcome to yet another uh, Fee Town Hall uh, series of A to Z online with Fee. I'm very glad to be talking about education today because, well, like we talked last time, I think all of us are homeschoolers today. Uh, many of the schools, uh, all of the schools are closed. Kids are learning home, kids are learning online. Uh, kids are learning from their parents, kids are learning during homeschooling. You could call this a disruption. One way or another, a disruption in education has happened and we are, we are living through the times of disruption. Uh, last time uh, I think these two things happened brings two historical parallels to, to my head. One of them is uh, the invention of the printing press. And as you might recall, uh, uh, the printing press was just an adaptation of a cheese press. But what it actually did, it made books affordable. And all of a sudden, people could read the books uh, they really cared about. They could read them, well, themselves, and they could interpret things themselves. I think that led to very big, not just educational disruption, it led to a very large spiritual uh, and also all sorts of knowledge disbursement dis dis uh, disruption. So that was, that was what, 500 years ago. And then, speaking about uh, pandemics and COVID, I think there was another disruption, well, many people called the Black Death, and that obviously was awful but what actually it led to that unexpected side effect of black death was well labor became valuable and people who were previously in serfs or quasi slaves they were actually liberated and uh well the 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 job creators of the time of the landlords started competing for their serfs and offering them better conditions and all of a sudden this thing that like paid labor became a thing and that led to many of the well liberation of people so obviously i think these the, the invention of a printing press and the black death obviously have have had higher importance in history but i think they there is something similar here happening today so today we're going to talk about transformations and disruptions in education and we have an excellent panel for you here so first of all we have eric julian who is a president and the ceo of center for excellence in higher education we have um, Kerry McDonald, who is a fee senior educational fellow and uh, basically a homeschooling guru. And then we have fees Mariana Davidovich Brashir, who's actually going to talk about some practical things, what fee is doing, or, or fee as a university, fee as a school, fee as an academy, what we are doing to make our, to make our life uh, or our education possible uh, during these times. So, like I said, a very, a very interesting panel. Uh, make sure to, to submit questions uh, so, you can ask, so we can ask uh, the panel, panel members later. But this, is def this definitely seems like a, a, a very disruptive time. So let's have Kerry McDonald share her thoughts. What is this disruption in education happening? Uh, is it just a bump? Is it one of the, just a, like a, a, your average flu pandemic, or will that actually lead to, to changes in how we do education? Carrie? I think it will, yes. Thanks, Z. It's really great to be here as part of today's webinar. You know, it is an odd juxtaposition, really, that at a time when families are isolated in their homes, lacking the freedom to go about ordinary routines of daily life, many are experiencing greater educational freedom, right? So we have over 50 million U.S. students, over 1 billion students worldwide not in school now due to COVID-19 and engaging in various degrees of school at home distance learning, sometimes called crisis schooling or COVID homeschooling. Of course, um, regular homeschoolers know this is nothing like typical homeschooling, but it does maybe give a glimpse of education without schooling. Uh, but in some ways, th this is a moment for educational freedom. Some states have shelved compulsory attendance mandates and curriculum directives, ending the school year early, sort of giving up on this virtual learning experiment with uh, hopes for improvement come fall. Um, or they're explaining that in many cases, any schoolwork being offered is optional and for enrichment purposes only. This is uh, often because they can't ensure equity, equitable access to the curriculum given um, differences in connectivity or computer access in, in different homes. So any of the work that's being sent home in many places is being considered optional. This presents a real opportunity, I think, for families to explore various education options and take a closer look at what their children may be learning or not learning in school. Uh, you know, some of these parents are getting a glimpse really for the first time what their children are doing. In fact, uh, a neighbor of mine 
surprised to discover that uh, her 10 year old who's in a local government school uh, was uh, had the teacher reading a book to the class as part of their virtual learning that this particular child read to herself four years ago. Uh, and that was quite eye opening for this particular parent. Another parent uh, sent me an email a couple of weeks ago saying, you know, he'd always been interested in homeschooling, uh, wanted to give it a try, but really never had that catalyst to do so. And this really gave him the chance to send a letter to the superintendent saying, you know, we're not going to continue with this remote learning experiment. We're going to full time homeschool, at least for now, and, and figure things out going forward. So I think it really is a moment for parents to feel re-empowered uh, and to begin to explore their different education options. This, I think, is going to become even more apparent as um, parents get more of these uh, images of schools reopening around the world. The Washington Post recently had a good article with a whole assortment of uh, photographs from schools around the world where you see young children in you know, full face shields or face masks. Uh, you see these really socially distanced classrooms. You know, NPR, for example, talked about if if and when schools reopen in the fall, there's likely to be staggered schedules where half the group will go to school Monday, Wednesday, and Friday one week, and then the other week they'll go Tuesday and Thursday and swap with uh, with the other groups. So there's going to be those kind of staggered schedules, no gym class, no cafeterias, potentially no parents allowed in school buildings. And I think this is again going to uh, prompt many parents to think about other options. Uh, um, you know, we see that private schools tend to be faring a little better in terms of responding to parental needs. Many of the private schools have been able to keep up with the curriculum and quickly adjust through uh, uh, to providing virtual learning that is high quality and satisfactory to parents because, of course, they have to or they'll go out of business. They are they need to be responsive to their these parents, these paying customers. Uh, Neil McCluskey over at the Cato Center for Educational Freedom is, is in fact keeping a, a running tally of the private schools that are shutting down as a result of COVID because the economic shock has been um, significant for them and they haven't been able to effectively respond nimbly with uh, some of these changes. And of course, uh, public schools continue um, unaffected by some of the, the pandemic issues. But I do think even though some of these private schools may be struggling, I think there, it's a real moment for educational entrepreneurship and particularly free market educational solutions as parents are put back in the driver's seat and they're disconnected from the reach of their school and its compulsory uh, schooling mandates. They're really searching for alternatives in my latest article at Forbes, I talk about you know four trends that I think we'll really see emerging over the coming months. Obviously, virtual learning will be huge. Um, you're already seeing ed tech venture capitalists shifting their portfolios. In fact, TechCrunch had an article recently where they interviewed several venture capitalists in the education space, in, or in general, in, in, in kind of all different uh, sectors, and they said that Earlier this spring, pre-pandemic, um, EdTech might have been a small sliver of their overall investment portfolio, and now it's uh, dominating their portfolio. So I think we're going to see a lot of tools, resources, and EdTech solutions. Um, and we already have you know, glimpses of some of that already. You have, um, for example, Arizona State University has a, an online high school degree program that also provides college credits. Uh, it's called ASU Prep Digital. It's free to Arizona students uh, through a charter school program, and it's less than $7,000 for out-of-state students. I think we'll see more of that. Um, we have I, I talk in the Forbes article about uh, uh, Sora Schools, which is an online high school startup that uh, is really gaining traction and getting a lot of more a lot more interest from parents who are now you know intrigued by virtual learning and the options that might exist there many of which are, are free uh, to the consumer to the user i think we'll also see a lot of growth in micro schools as parents look for smaller class sizes uh, less institutionalized learning not wanting to send their kids to buildings uh, overcrowded buildings and so forth so I think these networks of micro schools, such as the Prenda network, which is a rapidly growing uh, network of in-home micro schools that again operates under 
uh, an Arizona charter school uh, model. So again, uh, tuition free for Arizona residents and low cost for residents outside of Arizona. Uh, I think we'll also see interest in what are known as forest schools or the forest preschool outdoor schools uh, in kindergartens that really were gaining momentum prior to the pandemic. And I think we'll continue to gain momentum as parents again look for uh, options that are not so enclosed for their kids uh, and want you know more consistent full time uh, different options. And then finally, obviously, I think we will see an uptick in homeschooling. Um, Ed Choice just came out with a survey recently asking families about their impression of homeschooling as a result of the pandemic. And more than half of the respondents had a more favorable view of homeschooling as a result of the pandemic. Uh, even though, of course, we're all isolated in our homes and this is nothing like uh, real homeschooling, but that's a good signal that at least parents are thinking about different options. Uh, Corey DeAngelis over at the Reason Foundation, who you had on uh, one of the previous fee webinars a couple of weeks ago, recently did an informal survey asking over a thousand respondents, uh, what are they going to choose for education for their children when this is all over or this coming fall at least. And he discovered that 15% of parents say they plan to homeschool. That's in comparison to right now, three and a half percent of the US K to 12 school age population is homeschooled. So I think we will see an uptick in homeschooling, even if it's just temporarily. Uh, there's an article in NPR that cites some work by a healthcare economist who was researching parent behavior in, during the 1916 polio epidemic in New York City. And she found that even when schools reopened, one quarter of the parents didn't send uh, their kids to school. They were worried about uh, safety and health. And, uh, you know, of course, that's continuing to be an issue uh, today with coronavirus and some of the side effects that may even potentially be impacting children. Uh, and so I think we will see families that may decide to keep their children at home. And uh, in the wake of the 1916 polio epidemic, the New York City schools loomed their compulsory schooling, compulsory attendance laws uh, to not penalize these parents who were set, keeping their children. We'll see more parents. But I think there may be you know, more permanent um, interest in homeschooling and hybrid models where kids are outside of the home quite a bit it, taking various classes or going to these kinds of learning centers. Uh, and I think we'll see that because teleworking is becoming more popular. And in fact, the Brookings Institution just came out recently with a report showing that they expect a permanent shift toward teleworking uh, post pandemic. So as parents have more flexibility, I think they'll want to give that flexibility to their children. And I'll just sort of wrap up by saying that I think um, we're going to see more demand for school choice mechanisms like education savings accounts, vouchers, tax credit scholarships. Parents are going to be wanting uh, more options beyond their assigned district school and are going to really be interested in uh, more of these education choice programs that can give them those options and make more accessible some of these uh, programs that are otherwise financially out of reach. And I'll, I'll just finally uh, end by saying that I've been intrigued by uh, what happened in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. And Terry Moe out of Stanford University wrote a book called The Politics of Institutional Reform that came out about a year ago where he traced the what what how the disruption caused by Hurricane Katrina in 2005 dramatically transformed the New Orleans uh, school system to become what is continues to be uh, an almost all charter school system. And he argues this really couldn't have happened if it hadn't been for the massive disruption to this institutional role of education um, that was loosened due to Hurricane Katrina. I think we will see that this pandemic will also lead to dramatic transformation in K-12 education as well as, I'm sure, higher education. Excellent. Thank you, Carrie. I think it says a lot that it takes a hurricane or a pandemic to actually cause people to reform education. One very quick question to you. So you obviously we see demand for these changes. Uh, is the empire striking back? Do you think the system is already sort of noticing these changes and trying to stamp out the progress uh, as soon as it sees it? 
Well, I mean, of course, uh, I recently wrote for Fee about Harvard Magazine's recent attack on homeschooling, calling for a pres presumptive ban on the practice. I think that particular article was probably in the queue prior to the pandemic, but the timing was was certainly unusual. Uh, yes, I think that there will be, you know, calls for greater regulation in homeschooling. I think homeschoolers and anyone else sort of choosing something different needs to be watchful for increased regulation. Uh, we need to be pushing for policies like these education choice mechanisms that will expand education options for more families. We need to encourage entrepreneurs who really have such incredible ideas for these new agile models uh, for K-12 learning and really encourage them to bring their ideas to market and particularly now where, again, investors seem really interested in this space. All right. Through magic of technology, we're now switching from Cambridge to Salt Lake City. And we have, I'm really proud to have uh, Eric Julian with us. And uh, Eric, tell us what uh, the Center for Excellence in Higher Education is doing in, sort of in response, in response to this uh, new demand in education. I think you have some very interesting stuff to tell us. Sure, yeah, let me give you a little context. So CEHE owns and operates um, a group of 16 institutions of higher education that are nationally accredited and um, participate in the federal Title IV financial aid programs. And when I started as CEO 10 years ago, we had approximately 7,000 students in our 15 ground campus locations throughout the Western United States. And we had about 500 students in our online university, which delivers programs at the degree level, both associate, uh, baccalaureate and masters fully online. 10 years later, as we sit here today, we have about 1,200 students in our on-ground campuses and we have 9,000 students in our online university. So a fundamental shift in our business over the last 10 years. And you know the trends that you're seeing now exacerbated relative to the, the COVID disruption are something that we really started driving toward, I'd say five or six years ago. And we've put tremendous resources into building out the curriculum and the programs in higher ed at degree level. And our programs are traditionally, you know, what I would call career college focus. We don't have a lot of general education. We don't have any electives whatsoever. Every degree program we offer is, is tailored toward a, a specific career or employment outcome upon graduation. You know, unlike, a, a, I would say, a traditional public you know, university where you have a, a lot broader range of curriculum and a lot more options. So, you know, when we, when the COVID disruption hit, we certainly had to make some adjustments in our on ground campus operations, but with respect to our online operations, um, it's been almost a non-event. The only change we've seen relative to the deliver to our online university is a massive expansion in demand. You know, historically, we've started a, a group of students every we start monthly rather than semesters, which, again, is a unique model in that, you know, you're not waiting for these two points of a year, a fall semester and a winter semester to start your students. We've structured and designed our program where students can begin the curriculum, begin a degree program every four weeks. And we only deliver one course at a time per four week period. So the model is totally different and it's geared toward the flexibility and freedom that students, our typical students, non-traditional students are, are demanding now in the marketplace. And you know, the first prediction I think is you're gonna see a lot more of that embracing of that model in what I would call traditional higher ed, whether it be the community college systems or the traditional public institutions or large ground-based nonprofit institutions. That model that is designed to simply have these two key start points will not fit in a society where you're potentially having disruptions coming. And I think this one's highlighted it more than ever. You know, you've got a lot of turmoil going on right now with students who have a May 1 decision deadline to start at a traditional university in September or late August. They don't know if the school is going to open. The school doesn't know if they're going to open. They don't know how they're going to deliver the curriculum. Whereas an alternative model, which is much more free market oriented, where you're designing your model and your delivery around the needs of the end user, the customer, the student, that fits a lot better, I think, in this type of situation. But, you know, so so for us, it hasn't been a huge change. Certainly our ground campuses where we had a lot more face to face interaction, we had to move and shift. 
But even there, I think what you've seen in, in the career college sector or in the free market institution sector in higher ed, you've seen them four or five years ago moving aggressively to what we call the hybrid model. And I think you're going to see a, a significant expansion and more of this hybrid model in the traditional sectors of higher ed. And the hybrid model is really, you know, kind of a combination of both fully online delivery and then where appropriate that face to face interaction that can be done on lower scales, smaller number of students, which fits with where we are in the environment today. But a hybrid model allows you to toggle back and forth between how much you're doing online and how much you're doing in a face to face environment. And you can adjust those ongoing as the needs of the particular degree program change or as the need of the students or the institution change. And that again is a model that you don't see a lot of leverage being gained in the traditional sector for higher ed. So um, where do I see the future going as a, as a result of this disruption? I, I think two things, number one, you're gonna see a, a much more dramatic impact in the publicly funded sectors of higher ed than you are that those, those institutions that are more free market oriented. You know, you're, you're having kind of a, a, a perfect storm where not only is the institution disrupted and potentially losing students and trying to figure out how they're going to be able to deliver those students, but simultaneous with that, we're seeing a massive deterioration in the funding that is coming in through the traditional forms of tax revenue at the state level. That ultimately is going to translate, and we're already seeing signs of that, to the budgets and the resources available to a traditional ground-based, large established, whether it's a community college or a four-year university throughout the country. Um, you may have seen recent announcements from the University of Arizona in Tucson where they're projecting close to a $400 million impact to their budgets and resources moving forward in the remainder of the 2020-2021 academic year. So, you know, I, I think it's forcing them to look at alternatives. The problem you're going to see, and you're already seeing it, and some of you who have college age kids who have come home and have, are now attending an institution that is trying to rapidly flip from an on ground delivery mode to an online delivery mode. Online is not easy and to do online well and to deliver a fully online curriculum well is very difficult. It takes a, it actually takes more resources, I believe, than, than delivering a, a degree program or a, a college program at a physical ground based campus. You know, people talk to us at CEHE all the time and they, they say, well, we're, we're guessing that your margins, revenue after all your expenses, what's left, your margins are probably significantly higher in online than they are in your on-ground programs. And that's absolutely incorrect. What we find is we actually have lower margins in our online university than we do in our on-ground universities. And that's directly correlated to the increased expenditures we have to have for student support student engagement, student services. You can't simply do a Zoom course and have effective learning outcomes for your students. You have to really build out a very robust, multimedia rich engagement tool in what we call a learning management system so that you're hitting on all of those different learning styles for a student that is attending online. But secondary to that, you've got to have a massive infrastructure to do a lot of engagement, contact those students on a daily basis, have things that they need to go through on a daily basis, have that human being face to face, whether it's Zoom or on the telephone or via email to continue to support them and keep them motivated as they work through that curriculum. So, you know, I think that's one of our biggest competitive advantages. But I would agree um, with what Carrie said, you know, we're seeing a significant expansion in the ed tech space, I think is, is kind of the acronym or that, that what they're using to define that. But, you know, the best example I can give the, the listeners or participants here would be think about, you know, for, I'll give you two analogies. One would be the idea of a book and a movie. You know, you can read a book to say you can take that book, whether it's fiction or nonfiction and simply translate it into a movie and have that be a good entertaining movie is, is impossible. You have to rewrite the script. You have to figure out what you're going to show in a visual format versus a written format. And those two do not simultaneously translate to each other. But I think more importantly, what you're going to see is look at, compare a Google to where the universities or to where libraries used to be 50 years ago. A lot of information, a lot of content, all that material was available at a library, but it took a lot of effort to go get it and look through it. Google comes along and Google's magic is as a curator. 
to filter information, to point you to information, to go through that massive amount of data that is out there and provide it to you in a simple, easy way. I think where you're gonna see opportunity in the free market space in ed tech or in organizations that aren't physically delivering the education, whether, whether it's homeschooling in K-12 or in higher education, is those companies that can take that massive amount of content, put it into discrete units, very simple, very clean, easily delivered, highly engaging, and they can provide that to the K-12 market in a public format where they're shifting to hybrid or online delivery. They can provide it to a homeschooling community and, and consumers at that level. And they can also provide it to higher ed, who's now doing more hybrid and virtual online. So um, I'll pause there and let you move on. I have literally a gazillion questions to you, but I'll just, <laughs> I'll just, I'll just pick one. So I was very much surprised by the fact that your estimate that uh, you know electronic or online, good online learning actually is more expensive than the current uh, in person. That obviously, well, just explains how little I know about education, but. Perhaps the thing is maybe for successful new sort of online learning, we need uh, untraditional kind of teachers or untraditional professors. Maybe the problem right now is that you have your traditional sort of in-person professors trying to go online. Maybe we need a whole new class of, uh, of professors for that. Yeah, absolutely. I can tell you our own experiences. We shifted over the last 10 years from a focus to a, you know, more traditional on-ground programs to online. We, we found about a 70, what we call a 70-30 rule. You know, we took our on-ground faculty, many of whom had been with us for, you know, 10, 15 years. And as we started growing the online, it was a natural decision to give them the opportunity to become part of the faculty for the online. And we found that only about 30% of those instructors were able to make that shift and to adapt to the, the, the delivery of education in an online format in such a way that you still had high quality, high engagement, exciting classes, um, stimulating classes, keeping the students moving forward. And so over the last, I'd say seven years, we've developed a, it's almost a four month training program that our new instructors for online have to go through that includes shadowing some of our best instructors, but it takes that long to really get them to understand how to manipulate the learning management system, how to build a course shell with the different components, multimedia, text, audio, you know, all those files to, to keep that engagement moving. And, and, and my experience has been the vast majority of teachers who may be successful on ground typically are not successful in the online delivery. Very interesting. We'll talk to Eric a little bit later. And now we have Mariana uh, Davidovich Brashear joining us. Obviously, Mariana is his own. She's our uh, guru for homeschool. She's our director of uh, outreach uh, for educators. And well, FEE is a kind of a, also an educational institution, actually. We, so we also teach students, we also teach uh, teachers. So share your thoughts about how well, how we are adapting, you know, what's, uh, how is K-12 doing? Uh, basically, what does the world look like through, through your eyes? Would It would help if I am muted first. As you can see, we are all getting used to online technology. I'm used to speaking in public in person. So thank you for having me here. And I think that this is actually a tremendous opportunity, not just for fee, but for education entrepreneurs in general. What I'm seeing, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at what's going on the past two, three months through the eyes of an educator, a mother who actually homeschooled her children, um, I've had I've been involved with the K-12 online as well as brick and mortar school systems. So there's so much going on right now and it's really interesting to watch and see what's happening. So the feedback I'm getting is um, there's so many parts of it. So let me see if I can start. First of all, I, I do think this is a huge disruption and I think there's an opportunity because, um, you know, as Carrie mentioned earlier, there there's a lot going on in the news about um, a lot of scare tactics happening that, um, you know, a lot of parents are going to be afraid to send their kids back to brick and mortar schools. So all of these hybrid models, online learning, distance learning, this is all happening. In addition to there are teachers that are probably not going to want to go back to the schools as well, because um, 
18% of the teachers, I believe, 646,000 teachers are over the age of 55. And they're gonna be looking for maybe training opportunities to start teaching online as well. So um, what we're doing as an organization is, you know, we've been doing this for a really long time. We've been talking to teachers, we've been talking to parents, and we've been talking to students both in high school and college for many, many, many years. And based on our research and surveys that we've been doing, and actually we started doing this before the COVID crisis. So I think we're in a perfect position to be able to present um, a product that um, you know, will really help moving forward, no matter what happens in the education system. So if there is a movement to where brick and mortar um, to where teachers are needing more information online to be able to give to their students in the form of webinars, in the form of um, it, particularly teaching economics, we have a solution that we're working on and it should be ready in the next six weeks or so and it's called the Learning Center. And I just wanna share a few things about it, what makes it different. So the Learning Center is completely uh, customer centric, customer focused, customer being the educator. So whether this is an educator in the classroom, in the public school, private school, or home school, we're all educators when it comes to our children. So the Learning Center, in our minds, it's the ultimate tool that educators are going to be able to use in order to teach economics, even if they've never taught it before. And I just, I want to emphasize this because I'm not sure that people realize, but only 25 of the states actually require economics to graduate high school. So you are going to have people teaching econ, whether it's in person or online, it doesn't matter. We're going to have a product that's going to help them every step of the way and make it as easy as possible so they can teach exactly what they want to teach and have the materials that they're looking for. So it could be online um, publications, it could be videos, it could be quizzes, it could be activities, and the activities could be self-paced individual or group. So depending on the environment that the educator has, we'll have a solution for them. So um, for the educators, we will have a professional development overview of the topic. So this will be topic based. And um, the interesting thing in my mind that makes this really unique is that it's going to be dynamic. So updated on a regular basis based on uh, what's going on in the world today with really fresh and engaging content. And we have an incredible media department, incredible content department. Um, so this, this kind of flexibility in allowing teachers and educators in general to be able to customize what it is that they require, what they need, what they want for their students, um, that's going to be something new that uh, is going to be very easily adaptable to their LMS or to the lessons that they want to teach. Um, the next thing really, it's going to be a huge time saver. So we're building in a, a, a filtering system where they'll be able to find exactly what they're looking for in an instant. So this is gonna be incredibly time-saving and that's one of the biggest uh, complaints that we've received from educators in the past is that it's really frustrating that most of the content that they have from economics textbooks and elsewhere, they have to search the internet every week to find fresh content that's relevant and timely, not just timeless. So that's really a key differentiator in my mind. Um, the other thing I just want to mention is that traditionally, you know, FEE has been going out to teaching the students in person. And because of that shift, we've actually been able to shift to an online platform as well. And I'm happy to announce that we've done that very quickly and very efficiently. And so we are now using our FEE faculty um, and these are the people. And I think Eric talked about this earlier, just being able to train people who are very engaging and inspiring, especially for the audience that we have. Um, but we're right now we have about 20, I believe, uh, fee faculty that actually do these webinars and there's no charge for them. So if there's a group of students that needs um, one of the topics that we offer, we do that free of charge. So we're kind of combining that with our online platform called the Learning Center. So this is just a really exciting time for fee. And I'm you know thrilled that we're able to provide these kinds of products to the educators because this is actually what they've been asking for specifically. All right, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Mariana. It's definitely been a very interesting <laughs> time in fee. Uh, uh, 
and the f I'm really amazed by how fast we were able to shift from uh, the traditional we'll bring a professor to your high school uh, <laughs> mo model to you know let's all stare at the screen and listen to that professor speak and actually it worked out great another thing that I'm really excited about is the COVID-19 economics lessons that we are that we are making and the point there is uh, you know it's it's difficult to talk to children about uh, unemployment yeah. or things like that uh, that they don't usually encounter uh, and all of a sudden if you say well you know there is this phenomenon of of COVID-19, there is an epidemic, there is a shutdown that causes unemployment. Let's talk about what that means. So in a weird way, uh, kind of like the Black Death kind of way, uh, this pandemic opens ma very many doors to very many people's brains to think outside of the box. You know, what is actually, what is, what is unemployment if it is a pandemic? What is actually employment if it is a, if it is a pandemic? What is a value creation? Um, things like that. So thank you, Mariana, for helping out with us uh, all great, great efforts at feel like I said. Uh, ironically enough, even though we cannot travel, even though we cannot go to schools, I think the number of students we have reached is actually increasing and is increasing partially because we are adapting, adapting very fast. And to Eric's point, I think this is, I think he, he hit the nail on the head. Uh, then you have to transfer something online. Then you have to think about everything. Then you have to take that course and make it usable online you discover very many bugs that you would not discover uh, if you're just standing in front of the classroom and, and, uh, and talking. I mean, that, that, that environment is kind of forgiving because that you have your captive audience. The students are sitting there. They are more or less expected to be polite. So if, if you're a teacher, if you, even if you don't give 100%, you still think that you, you actually did a good job. If you're online, uh, if it is five seconds or 10 seconds in which you're not interesting, the students will switch off. And I think that's the... That's the, the, the big challenge here is actually how to be good all 45 minutes or all, all 20 minutes or whatever the duration of a, of a class is. So yes, online environment is actually less forgiving because there are so many, so much more distractions uh, in, in this world. Anyway, but I think we as feet are definitely coping well and precisely because of the pandemic, some of the projects that we're thinking actually got accelerated. The Learning Center, uh, the COVID economics, the going online or establishing our online arm, establishing our educational arm, all these things have been, well, accelerated by the pandemic and I'm really, really, really glad about that. We have a couple of questions for, for all of you. Uh, let's start with Eric. Eric, uh, we have a question from the audience and the person is asking, how do we begin to actually integrate free market lessons into higher education? Uh, can we make these models national? And by talking to the person, I think what he means is, obviously we observe that there is a lack of uh, sort of free market ideas in any kind of lesson, take it, take, be it economics, history, or, or music. So in your opinion, is there a way to actually bring in more free market oriented content into higher education? Yeah, I, I think not only higher education, but also potentially K-12. I mean, one of the things that, you know, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about is, is if you're going to see more opportunities for, you know, free market providers, not, not only at the actual institution to student engagement level, but with some of the ed techs that we talked about who will likely be building models, infrastructure, curriculum, and curating content for providers, um, you know, my, my guess would be that if you've got a bunch of free market businesses that are curating or providing or developing content, in all likelihood, they're going to certainly impart some of those concepts and beliefs into their curriculum. Um, because I would assume, you know, very much like CEHE, we certainly have a bias toward, you know, those principles um, and those concepts. So, you know, you, you, if I take an, an economics course that we develop, compare that to an economics course that maybe a um, public faculty member of a teacher's union develops, you're probably going to pick some different content um, and emphasize certain concepts um, that may resonate more based on your predisposition. So, you know, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about that. But, you know, CEHE also has a philanthropic arm where we specifically provide resources and funding to groups that are trying to add more free market concepts and principles in, in, in higher ed and even in lower. I know, I think one of our board members, Rajari Argawal at the University of Maryland is very involved in putting together economic curriculum for the K through 12 market specifically. 
both in an online delivery as well as you know in kind of on ground content or, or brick and mortar content so um, I'm optimistic about it. I, I, I do think, though, it's just simply going to come from an expansion in those opportunities for both profit based businesses and potentially nonprofits who share that mindset or have that perspective and are curating or developing content. Yeah, that's exactly what Fee is doing. I mean, the, those lesson plans uh, that Mariana talked about, these are precisely designed to be used by a teacher. And when I say a teacher, I mean not your creme de la creme teacher, but your average kind of teacher, teacher who needs to teach a gym class, shop, and economics. So that kind of material. So hey, we are, hey, we should be in business. <laughs> All right, a question for Kerry, very similar to, to I think what we, what we asked them uh, before, but do you see the anti-independent school movement as a sort of legitimate threat uh, to a momentum? Uh, basically, do you, I think it's a similar iteration on the Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, I mean, I still think that there there is going to be a lot of room now for visionary entrepreneurs who recognize these Im immense opportunities. Um, you know, as schools are trying to figure out their way, uh, trying to get up to speed on virtual learning for the fall, they're still going to have to deal with staggered classrooms and social, social distance measures are still gonna be dealing with parents who are not going to wanna send their kids back. So it's a great moment for entrepreneurs to come in and really uh, add some more options uh, and, and contribute to, I think, what is this dramatic disruption in K-12 education. Okay, but sorry, let me, let me reiterate. Uh, there is another question. Do you think increased regulation uh, will be quickly implemented? Or do you see it shifting from state to federal level as numbers of homeschooling increases? So the question is once again, if once, you know, once our side picks up momentum, once homeschooling becomes more popular or hybrid models become more popular, you know, do you expect uh, someone doing something against it? Right. Well, when we talk about homeschooling specifically, I mentioned that there you know, is this opposition already to homeschooling. Uh, I can talk a little bit more again about this Harvard Magazine article that came out in the current issue of the May-June um, Harvard Magazine. And it spotlights a uh, longtime Harvard Law School professor, Elizabeth Bartholet, who, who wrote an 80-page um, law review article, law review, laying out her argument calling for a presumptive ban on homeschooling. One of the, I think, the key worries in that longer Harvard Law Review piece is that she's really calling for uh, a different interpretation of the US Constitution. Uh, she calls the US Constitution, quote, outdated and inadequate and pushes um, us to move from this sort of negative rights theory that we've historically focused on, where individuals are free from state intervention to a positive rights theory where the state is granting rights and takes a much more interventionist role in individual lives and particularly in the lives of families and children. Uh, that's what we need to be watchful for. And I think that's the real threat at the federal level. I mean, we're lucky that uh, the US Constitution makes no mention of education. And so, you know, we have that uh, going for us, but I think we do have to be watchful for particularly these advocates who are looking to um, kind of reinterpret the Constitution and particularly uh, this, this historic uh, position of upholding the liberty interest of parents to raise and educate their children as they see fit. Um, so we do need to be watchful for that. We're fortunate that we have uh, homeschooling legal in all 50 states ha has been since the mid 1990s. And I think uh, homeschoolers at the state level are really going to have to be vigilant about making sure to continue to uphold their rights, to push back against uh, increased regulation uh, and to secure their freedom. Okay, uh, question to all of you. That's quite an interesting question. What about the future of the arts? So think about the sort of post-pandemic world. So sure, we can teach history online. I guess we can teach economics online as well. Uh, what about art? And uh, the person says, we've heard that some schools are stopping the use of shared musical and artistic instruments. Here we go, as a curveball, any of you want to answer that? I can jump in here just for a second. I mean, I have two older teenagers. I've been homeschooling most of their lives. And as an individual and as a parent, I have always wanted choices for my kids. They have two completely different educational needs and educational learning styles. 
and interests. And I've never met another parent that says, no, 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 I don't want that many choices for my child. I just want to send them exactly where the government tells me to send them. So, you know, we're talking about individual rights here. And one of the reasons I wanted to homeschool my kids is so I could have these opportunities to send my kids to the arts, to sports, to the things that they were interested in. So I know it's not exactly what they're asking, but in essence, what people want, they want, they want to have, it seems like they want to have their cake and eat it too. You want someone to have this perfect solution. And what I'm saying is there's no one government solution to the perfect education system. And what we have to watch out for is government overreach. So if we want to maintain choice, and the more choices, the better. Think about it like this. When you and your family decide to go out to eat, are you going to go to the first place you see? Well, if you're really hungry, if you're like my family, we're going to do our research and we're going to we're going to see what the feedback was and what the reviews are. And it's the same thing with education. It, it's in essence, it's a business. So we want to send our kids to the best programs to, with the best teachers and give them the best opportunity we can. So right now, what I think is really important to think about and to ensure that we protect our homeschooling rights and to ensure that parents have as many choices as possible. So when you ask questions like that, what comes to my mind immediate, immediately is, you know what, the government, whether it's federal, whether it's state, they're gonna quickly jump in and say, oh, you know what, we're, we're gonna need more money to have more programs. That's always what comes to my mind. So we just have to be really careful um, about what our priorities are going forward. So in my mind, it's the more choices, the better. Okay, uh, Carrie, Carrie and Eric, I'll remind you the question was about what do we do about art? Yeah, well, let me jump in. I, I, I kind of have firsthand experience here. I have a, my son, my youngest is a freshman at Montana State University and he's an art major. Um, and he had finished his first semester and then was, you know, coming up on spring break and came home for spring break here in Utah and obviously has, you know, not gone back for the last eight weeks because they, they went to online or tried to do online. The, my observation of it coming from a world that delivers online education was it was woefully inadequate um, and no criticism of Montana State University. They were trying as hard as they could and having to move very quickly to online. But it was particularly interesting to watch an art student trying to complete a sculpture class online. Um, and, you know, it was it was the most frustrating thing he, he had to go through because, you know, I think one of the tangible aspects to art is being in the studio, um, having a wide availability of materials to work with and having the collaboration and creativity that is stimulated by working with other aligned individuals who also have that that disposition or desire toward creativity and building something out of nothing. Um, which I will confess, I, I, I can do magic with a spreadsheet, but I can't do anything when it comes to paint or sculpture or that, those kind of artistic things. So um, it was fascinating to watch. And I, I think, you know, I don't, how I would respond to the question is, I think you are always going to find these components, again, you know, what, based on what Mariana said, if, if I have a, a, a desire, a passion for arts, and that's where I want to go, or someone may be different, there are going to be those disciplines, those areas where 100% online is, is not going to be fully viable or satisfying for someone to gain those skills or to gain that experience. But I really, I'll go back to the hybrid and I'll use an example from our own degree programs. We have an online degree program, an associate degree program in medical assisting high employment demand, high desire for those people. It's a great way to you know, do a very short 20 month program and then they can go get employed and move their way up in the healthcare support field or the allied health field. Medical assisting has a, a portion where you know, a student needs to learn how to do phlebotomy. They need to, how to do sticks, how to draw blood, how to take blood temperatures, how to do cardiac measuring. And you know, no student is gonna have that material or equipment at home to be able to do it on their own. And there's no, there's no content provider, maybe a virtual simulation that could be provided, but by and large, they are physically gonna need to have that tangible learning take place. And I'll, I'll, I'll use that in the idea of my answer to the art, art curriculum. But so what we've done is, you know, we provide, I'd say 90% of the curriculum online. 
And then we run these weekend training sessions where we fly them all into Salt Lake City or in Atlanta or other areas where we have relationships. And they do a very intensive three, four, five day hands on where they learn how to do the needles and draw the blood and do all the safety procedures and all those kind of things. So you got to find that right mix. And I think with respect to art education, you know, my hope is that traditional universities that deliver the bulk of art programs for your universities, community colleges can embrace and will embrace, you know, that they can do 70% of the curriculum, the theory, the art history, a lot of that stuff that you need to build the mental capacity to then, you know, expand your creativity can be done in an online world and done very well. But then what they can do is they can use their limited resources to really make the best, the finest, the most robust hands-on component like Mariana was talking about when they're actually doing that art. So I think it's an opportunity for them, whether they will have the capacity to seize that opportunity and really make the best of the hands-on and the best of the online, I, I think is yet to be seen. And I think that's the challenge. Um, because I think a lot of traditional sectors of higher education have this built-in desire to protect the model that they are comfortable with. Nobody likes change. Nobody likes coming out of their comfort zone. And when pushed and when the demand profile that we're seeing in this economy and from consumers is for a very different model from what we've had historically for the last 50 years in higher ed, that's disruptive, that causes anxiety, that causes stress, and you're seeing simultaneous with that a decline in the resource to support those models. So, you know, it, it, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Well, let me skip Carrie and actually combine the two last questions into one question. And also that's for all of you. And the question is, uh, well, without government schools, schooling would become fragmented. Some would know much and others would know little. Uh, so the, this is obviously the question coming on. What, if the government got out of education, if we abandoned national curriculum, if every school had their own curriculum, wouldn't we kind of live in a very fragmented world of, well, well instead of haves and have-nots, but kind of knows and knows-nots? And the second question, of course, choice is good when you have money, choice is good when you have economic means. What about economic income challenge children? How do we provide choices with them? So basically, I think this is very much an inequality argument. If we got government out of the schools, if we all went you know, sort of free market schooling, would, would the market be able to provide for those who have not? Maybe, Kerry, you, should, yeah. you, you can start with <laughs> Great. you. Right. Well, you know, I'd start by questioning whether or not the government schools are actually doing a, a good job. We're spending $700 billion a year in taxpayer money for K-12 schooling. And yet the latest results from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, the nation's report card, finds that two-thirds of fourth and eighth graders are not proficient in reading. Uh, and it gets worse if you look at some of the other content areas like civics and history and so on. So I would wonder and challenge this idea that the government schools themselves are doing a good job. And in fact, are, you know, we're seeing increasing investments in K-12 education over the past 50 years with stagnant or declining performance results. So that, you know, is the first piece of it. I think, um, to the point, the second point around access to various other options, private alternatives and so forth. Again, we have to expand education choice mechanisms like education savings accounts, vouchers and tax credit scholarships uh, that make many of these education options more accessible to more families, uh, increase charter schools support for that to really uh, open up more options for families. And then again, encouraging educational entrepreneurship. Okay, Eric or Mariana? I would, I would echo a little bit of that. I, 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 you know, I, I think it would, you, you'd certainly have a, a, a time, at least in my perspective, you know, a time lapse for a period of time. If you, if you simply eliminated, I think all the public K through 12 and went to a total free market model. Um, you know, initially I think there would be some that potentially would be underserved, but I, I think the one thing we've seen in the history of this country um, is the free market responds very fast to those incentive mechanisms to fill those voids and those gaps. And I, I have no doubt that you would have a certain group of enterprises that would be focusing on the lower served, underserved, however you want to characterize that market in K-12. 
And if you just simply look at the economics about how large that population is, that's a very desirable market. You know, I would echo again, I think if the funding was tied to the student making a selection of where they wanted to go for education, you would see a massive movement, not only at the venture capital level, but across free enterprise to develop systems and models to deliver to that market because there would be a huge potential revenue source. So I think it would, there'd be a gap for a period of time, but ultimately five, six, seven years down the road, overall, I think you would have much higher performance and much higher statistics as far as the actual educational attainment, because end of the day, if a particular enterprise is not delivering the outcomes, which is what drives a free market system, then they're not going to stay in business. Right now, you have a system and a structure in place that does not have to produce any tangible outcomes. And there's no accountability to the outcomes, whether good or bad, that they do generate. So I think that's the fundamental piece that's missing. And you will, at least as far as my study of history, whenever you've seen models that are accountable and measurable for those outcomes and performance by consumer choice and demand, you typically end up seeing constant improvement in the quality of the product, whether it be education, whether it be an Apple iPhone or, 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 or pick an industry or sector. Mm -hmm. I, um, I'm so glad that you said that because I think accountability is such a key thing to talk about, as well as the idea that education, all of these schools, I mean, this is at the end of the day, it is a business. However, the government side of it is not accountable. So what we're seeing is let's look at the signals. And what I've noticed based on the signals, at least in the state where I live, which is Georgia, we have two free, I put that in quotes, uh, charter school that are char charter online schools. One is K-12 and one is Georgia Connections Academy. And what we've seen over the past two months alone is an increase in parents wanting to take their kids from the traditional brick and mortar and put them on an online into an online program. My question is, why are there so many restrictions and regulations in place to hinder the expansion of these kinds of programs? So we're talking about choice. And if the parents want it and the children want it, and we're actually, and this, this goes to the question that somebody asked about low income, that's a growing population of all of these online programs that are being offered. So if that's any indication, and that's one of the reasons we, we're so passionate about teaching economics. So let's, let's talk about market signals. And this is a, a prime example of what's happening. So in the school um, that my, my kids went to, they're on a waiting list right now. Um, not my children, but anyone who wants to put their kids into a public charter online program, they cannot, there's a waiting list. Um, the other one, a friend of mine is on the board and he told me the other day that right now, not, not only is there a waiting list, the waiting list has doubled of recent, in recent weeks. And I will tell you that they are capped right now at 4,500 students. This is an online charter school. And they're only allowed to increase by 500 students a year if they meet, if they hit all of their benchmarks. How all of those benchmarks are determined. I mean, again, we're, we're talking about more and more, you know, layers of government inter interfering because at the end of the day, we have to listen to what the teachers, the children and the parents want. We are responsible for our own children. And if we want these kinds of programs, we're letting the market signal this. What I'm seeing and what I'm afraid of is the government intervening because it's about money, right? And um, I think what Carrie mentioned earlier, and Eric, I think you mentioned this as well, we have to keep the system as free as possible to offer as many choices as possible. Because the, the parents, they're, they're speaking their part. They're telling us, this is what we want. Why, why is there such a long waiting list and why are they not allowed to send their kids where they want to send them? And also, many, many years ago, when I first started homeschooling my kids, there was something called Khan Academy. Nobody had heard of it. It's free and it is privately run. And there are tons of donors pouring money into it. And it used to be just math. Now it's all topics. I mean, look what Apple is doing with coding. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. There are so many homeschool groups. You can go on there, pick a subject put it on the Facebook page and you'll have parents that are on top of it, finding free market solutions to the topic that you are looking for, whether it's a core academic, whether it's the arts, whether it's sports. 
See, the thing that really gets me or annoys me when we start talking about free market solutions is that the, the bar of excellence for free market solutions is usually sky high. It says, you know, if it's education, it has to be, uh, everyone needs to learn, it has to be accessible to everyone, it has to do miracles and wonders, it, it has to take every child and make a scientist out of him. So, and then you actually compare this bar to what's happening in actual schools or, or actual government solutions, then the bar is much lower. People start talking about, well, maybe the kids don't learn anything in schools, but at least they socialize or get lunch. So this is the double standard that really, that really gets me. It's, once again, if it's, a, it's, if, it, if it's a free market solution, be it education, be it healthcare, be it anything, it has to be perfect, superb out of this world. If it's a government solution, eh, you know, that'll do. So this is, the, this is I think, is a, is a huge double standard that we need to highlight. Okay, we need to, we need to wrap up. Final questions. Eric. If someone wants to enroll their kid or someone wants to enroll into your online college, where should they go? Um, independence.edu. Independence.edu. Go there, uh, get enrolled. Mariana, if someone wants to learn more or get some of these, some of these lesson plans or these COVID economic plans, what should they do? I would go to fee.org slash classroom. That's where we're going to be updating all of our information on the Learning Center as well as our webinars. And I didn't mention, but the four webinars currently available are economics and government or civics, entrepreneurship, what you need to know about money before you're 20 years old, personal finance, as well as pivotal moments in American history. And that's the economic history of the United States. So again, go to fee.org slash classroom. Okay, excellent. Now, if you liked our, uh, our online A to Z town hall and you want to sort of continue engaging with us with this with us on Monday, May the 18th, which is next Monday. Yay, that's next Monday. We're going to have a whole uh, seminar about occupational licensing basically. Mm -hmm. How can people start uh, doing different jobs? How can people go into different professions? What are the government barriers preventing people from starting a new businesses? And we and we have we are I'm very glad we have a uh, people from Goldwater and Nice Center for the Study of Occupational Regulation who are going to join us as experts and we're going to tackle the question of occupational licensing. Thank you everyone who cares about, uh, thank you for everyone who cares about education. Thank you for joining us on A to Z Town Hall with Fee and I'll see you guys next Monday.